Well, I said, well, I'll talk more about game theoretic statistics, game theoretic probability, and in particular, I wanted to talk about uh, how it uh, has applications to finance. Uh, <clears throat> so, um, uh, this talk focuses on a particular um, uh, empirical fact about finance, which has not been not really been explained to everyone's satisfaction. Uh, and the the um, uh, the it's called the equity premium puzzle. So in finance, equity refers to stocks as opposed to bonds. And we all know that, I guess we know, uh, uh, I've been in business school a long time, so maybe I make too many assumptions about what everybody knows, but I think everybody knows that stocks pay better than bonds on average. Uh, and there's a explanation for why stocks pay better than bonds is because they're riskier. Uh, so uh, you're, you're willing to put your money into bonds because they pay a certain interest, and that, but they're safer than the stocks. Um, if you actually look at what happens in history, it's not clear this is even true. Uh, it may not even be true that bonds are safer than stocks. But in any case, the, the theory about we're being safer uh, and the risk aversion theory basically doesn't work. Uh, risk aversion will explain some of the difference, but not all the difference. Uh, the premium that stocks pay is bigger than the theory can explain. Now, in economics, when you have something that simple theory can't explain, you make the theory more complicated. So there are you know, several hundred explanations. <laughs> Uh, of this anomaly. Uh, none of them are really, well, I, I think I can fairly say there's no consensus. Uh, many people think they have an explanation, but uh, uh, everybody has a different explanation. Uh, and so none of them are good, that convinced. Uh, so here, uh, this talk gives a game theoretic explanation. Um, uh, and according to this game theoretic explanation, uh, the premium for stocks is really just due to speculation, uh, not to risk aversion. Uh, and this game theoretic explanation uh, accounts for the, how large, does a better job of accounting for how large the premium is. Um, So um, I focus on the equity premium because it's something very concrete. Uh, but really, from a theoretical point of view, uh, there's something bigger going on here, which is that game theory probability uh, can not only explain the equity premium, but it can explain why stock prices look like Brownian motion. So, uh, this is a another common feature. Why? I mean, I could ask you, does anybody know other explanations for why stock prices look like Brownian motion? Why do they jerk around like Brownian motion or geometric Brownian motion? What's the reason for that? Jerks buy and sell stocks. <laughs> Some people think it's because of objective probability. <laughs> But the question is, why do the objective probabilities look like that? Uh, so uh, in this theory, this apparent stochasticity is a emergent phenomenon. Uh, it just results from uh, the speculation. So here's a detail. Um, this is something that was first reported in the 1970s. There's a guy, I forget his first name, there's a guy named Mayra. Uh, whose work first reported this in the late 1970s. Uh, it's one of those typical, um, you know, discoveries. They couldn't publish it because nobody wanted to believe it. Uh, so Prescott, uh, Mayer was a student of Prescott. Prescott has won a Nobel Prize for his theory of rational expectations. 
which is the objective probability of economics, <laughs> if you will. Uh, but Mayrose is a student, and Mayra noticed this, phenom this phenomenon that with the, the usual, the standard, he actually put numbers in and tried to see what risk aversion would explain, and he just couldn't make it explain what's actually observed. So Mayra uh, has made a career of this puzzle, uh, published more and more about it, published an anthology of different explanations. Uh, and in 2008, there's a kind of a definitive review that he and Prescott made, and they said that actually stocks did six percentage points better than bonds over, over a century, from 1889 to 2005. And the standard risk aversion theory could explain that it should be one percent, do one percentage point better. Uh, so that is the discrepancy that needs to be explained. So here is the game theoretic explanation. Game theoretic explanation is that speculation is the primary cause of the volatility uh, of stock prices. In other words, stock prices vary a certain amount. Most of that variation is just due to speculation. That's uh, according to the theory I'm going to explain to you. Speculation actually is what makes the market efficient. Uh, so what does the market efficient mean? That means the prices are the right prices. You're not going to make any money from them because the price is already right. Why is the price already right? Because everybody else is out there trying every strategy they can to make money off of the prices. So and speculation already, means that, that Different people have different values. That they most, most of the uh, most of the trading that goes on in the stock market, there's no question. Most of the trading that goes on in the stock market is being done by speculators. Uh, their values don't have anything to do with it except they want to make money uh, because they don't hold the stock long enough. They're not investors. Uh, most of the trading in the stock market is short-term trading. But they're uh, guessing at what the value would be when they sell it, right? I was thinking well, it's that. hard to say whether these algorithms are guessing anything. Uh, the, most of the trading is, is being driven by algorithms. Uh, we say, you know, if these other prices do this, buy this. If these prices do this, buy that. So you could say somebody is guessing something, but actually they're just running algorithms. It could be machines. And they are machines. And furthermore, uh, the guy that's running this algorithm is running three or four other algorithms, and they all contradict each other uh, because he only has to make money on one of them. Uh, especially if they're algorithms that aren't risking too much and they're trying to multiply the money they risk, uh, then you only have to to uh, uh, to make money on one of them. If you have a new idea about how to uh, play the market uh, based on available information. Uh, these guys will be glad to hear, hear from you because it's, no, it's easy for them to implement one more algorithm. They're already running many. So uh, the argument is this speculation actually forces, here's the key point. It turns out that speculation forces an efficient market. What's an efficient market? An efficient market is one where you can't make money off of it because somebody else has already made all the money by speculating. If the market is efficient, then it turns out that mere speculation will force the market to appreciate the market that is the index of the market, the Dow Jones average or the S&P 500, that's better, will force the S&P 500 to appreciate, to increase in value in proportion to the square root of its, to the square of its volatility. Uh, the volatility is the square root of the variance, and the square of the volatility is the variance. So this is, um, uh, this is one of the themes of our book from 15 years ago. We start, we don't start with a probability model. We don't start with objective probabilities or subjective probabilities. We start with the game. And the probabilities are the emerge from the game. That is the uh, uh, picture. So I'll repeat it again. There's three things I just said. One is the three roles of speculation that causes volatility. Now, this is no secret. The fact that speculation causes volatility, people in the market, the traders, know this. Uh, not the theoreticians. 
you talk, you go over to the math department and talk to the mathematicians that teach fin uh, mathematical finance, they may not know this, they may not tell you this, they may deny it, but you talk about, the, you talk to the people who are playing the game, they will tell you uh, that the volatility is caused by speculation. Uh, there's a conventional wisdom even in academia that the speculation is what makes the market efficient because it exhausts the possibilities of making money. If there's so many enough people running enough algorithms, anything you could think of, then you go out and run one of those algorithms, you're not going to make any money because that's already been priced out of the market. Uh, it's already been squeezing. Any money that we made that way has already been squeezed out of the market. So. Uh, you and I are not going to get anywhere. But our theoretical contribution is this third point, that the speculation forces the market to appreciate in proportion to its volatility square. Is there a maximum that a volatil volatility could be, depending on the size of the, or something about the market? Is there a maximum volatility could be? Um, it actually would be helpful to well, we'll we understand look at what the definition you define of volatility. Yes, we'll define it. Uh, if the percentage change, so I guess as a practical matter, it's maximum. What if you right. allowed insider trading information? Will it still overcome uh, the advantage that people with insider information have? Uh, when you say it's efficient, I think that's what that's called. What's that called? The super efficient hypothesis that not even yeah, insider I'm, trade. No, I'm talking about. Well, the insiders are probably also <laughs> making it efficient by exhausting any possibility you can, uh, that you and I can accomplish anything. Uh, but I'm not, that's not my theme here. Okay. Um, are you going to, will you define, is, is there a specific, is there a uh, precise meaning to speculation? That, or? Well, I'm kind of, giving you some words to understand what I'm going to do mathematically. So uh, after you understand what I'm doing mathematically, maybe you want to change the words. Uh, I think so. so speculation is a little bit provocative. Uh, but I will quote, rather than using my own words, let me quote John Hall. So the leading author, uh, the leading textbook author on, on option pricing. So when I when I, taught in our, when I taught option pricing in the Rutgers MBA program, I used John Hall's textbook. And I think everybody else who teaches MBA uh, option pricing uses John Hall's textbook. Uh, it's probably in its 16th edition, something I think. I may be quoting from its 13th edition or something. So I think I am quoting it word for word. He says, what causes volatility? It is natural to assume the volatility of the stock is caused by new information coming to the market. You get new information, the price goes up. You get some discouraging information, the price goes down. He says, this new information causes people to revise their opinions on the value of the stock, the price of the stock changes, and volatility results. This view of what causes volatility is not supported by research, quoting Mr. Paul. The only reasonable conclusion from the actual research is that volatility is to a large extent caused by trading itself. And traders usually have no difficulty accepting this conclusion. So. Those are the words of uh, Mr. Hall. Uh, let me see. Uh, I guess I've left out. I used to have some slides which give some more information about this. What is the research that, that justifies this, that trading causes volatility? Uh, so volatility is the um, amount that the uh, stock varies let's say the amount of the stock varies, uh, the amount of the price changes uh, from month to month, up and down. Uh, or you can measure it on a daily rate, you can measure it on a monthly rate. Uh, here's a way that you could, that historically, here's, a what, here's something that has increased volatility. If you increase the trading time during the day by 15 minutes. That increases volatility. The amount of change up and down every day goes up if you increase the amount of trading time by 15 minutes a day. That's been observed historically. If you look at, if you look at weeks where there's a holiday, 
the volatility is less. Uh, there's all kinds of research like that in all kinds of different markets that have observed that fact. The more you let people trade, now, you know, nowadays we have, we're getting more and more 24-hour trading because it's online and whatever. So there's less opportunity to get that kind of, uh, uh, of evidence. But the evidence is very strong. Mr. Hall considers it overwhelming uh, that the majority, the largest part, the largest traction of the volatility is not due to new information. It's due to people trading against each other. The more time and, and opportunity you give them, the more technology and time you give them to trade against each other, the more ups and downs there will be. Uh, what's going on? They're all playing because you know most of it is they're all playing games. It's not it's not what they think the price is worth. They think it's what the other guy's going to do. So let's try and find some new way to trade that will psych out the other guy. You give you know you get a, the more of this you have going on, the more ups and downs are going to be. Uh, that the conclusion was that that over time it goes up. Yeah. That's another, that's another conclusion. Right now, I'm only on what causes volatility. That's astonishing. That's number one. What causes volatility? I'm three. Speculation causes volatility. Speculation makes the market official. Speculation causes the market to go up. Those are, but I'm only on number one. Speculation causes volatility. Now, what, what is an efficient market? In 1965, Eugene Fama, who got, a, who got a Nobel Prize for this, uh, wrote papers, a paper about how um, an efficient market is one in which the prices incorporate all the information. Uh, in 2001, we gave our definition of an efficient market. Barry won't be surprised. Our definition of efficient market is Cournot's, is Cournot's principle. <laughs> No strategy selected in advance will multiply your capital by a large factor. Now, it's always true that something unlikely happens. You know, this is called the sort of lottery paradox. After the fact, you could always figure out how you could have made money, right? <laughs> but the point is, you're not going to find a strategy in advance uh, that is going to multiply the capital you risk by a large factor. Uh, this still has not, this definition has still not been exploited by the finance people. Uh, they sometimes try to test, they sometimes do try to test their concept of market efficiency with uh, strategies that try to make money. But they do not have, they have not realized that they need to control the capital risk. Because this version of efficient market efficiency, it doesn't say that you can't find a strategy that makes money. George Soros made a lot of money in the stock market. How did he do that? He did that by risking other people's money. Uh, he had a line of credit. So he didn't multiply the capital he was, he multiplied the money he had in by a large factor. But he didn't multiply the capital he's risking by a large factor. So multiplying the capital you're risking by a large factor means you start with $1 and you try to multiply it to $1,000. Uh, and if you have only uh, 35 cents at the moment, that's all you can bet is 35 cents. No credit. Uh, that's, the, uh, that's the kind of strategies that we consider. Why should a market be efficient? Fama said, what's because speculators use each bit of uh, new information. Uh, Schaefer and Roth say it's because speculators are using every trick they can already try and if there's any trick that worked, it's already worked. And if you keep playing the same trick over and over, it's going to quit working because you've, uh, the prices adjust. You know, uh, you've got to have counterparties, and you run out of counterparties that will sell and buy with you at that. So all the, the strategies that are working are going to be exhausted. That's, uh, that is the uh, explanation. Yeah. How do we test whether a market is efficient? Fama's idea was that you had to postulate a model and test it statistically. Uh, this has, um, there's a famous word for this, why the, the problem with this is in order to test efficiency, you need to test more than efficiency. This is called the, um, what do they call it? There's a name for it. The auxiliary hypothesis problem. That's not right. There's something like that. It's the, uh, it's the fact that uh, 
you have to have a, st a, st a, st a probabilistic or stochastic or, st or statistical model to test. And efficiency is not a model in itself. So you've got to add to your hypothesis of efficiency some statistical model and test that. So you're not just testing efficiency. You're testing some model you made up. Uh, but we can test efficiency in the game theoretic approach without any model. We just try to multiply our capital by a large factor. Uh, try a strategy. If the strategy multiplies capital by a large uh, factor, we have uh, said the market's not efficient. We can make money from it. Uh, your prices are not good prices. We define a trading strategy. You have to put your money where your mouth is, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Or we can just do it theoretically. <laughs> We've got to do it in advance. So we multiply our money by 1,000. We reject that bus of efficiency. And that's just like a significance level of 1 to 1,000. Uh, that's, uh, uh, that's the concept. Um, <clears throat> so what is it we think is efficient? Now, I've been talking vaguely about the efficient market. The reasonable hypothesis is that there's a market index which is efficient, like the S&P 500. Now, basically, the S&P 500 index in uh, the American stock market, for practical purposes, the S&P 500 is the entire market. The stocks that are not in the S&P 500 are, are a negligible, are, you know, a small fraction. Uh, so uh, if you invest in, so there are now funds which allow you to basically invest in the entire market. Uh, and that means when the index S&P 500 goes up 5%, your money goes up 5%. If the S&P 500 goes down 5%, your money goes down 5%. Now, how do they do that? Um, as prices of stocks change, the composition of the S&P 500 index changes. Uh, because if uh, the price of this stock goes up and the price of this stock goes down, the one that went up is a bigger share of the, um, of the index. So uh, somebody who wants to hold the market needs to adjust for that. You need to sell the loser and buy the winner. So there are people that do that, that track the index. So, and you can buy, they, so there are various, um, these are exchange traded funds. And for instance, Vanguard will sell you a, um, uh, a fund which tries to match the S&P 500 and does a pretty good job. And they charge you, they're pretty reasonable, they charge you five basis points per year for doing that. So what's a basis point? A basis point is 1% of 1%. Uh, so five basis points is one, um, what is that, two thousandth of your money. Uh, they'll charge you one two thousandth of your money every year uh, as their fee for that treaty. So our hypothesis is uh, that speculation makes the market efficient in the sense that you can't beat the market index. In other words, putting your money in one of these funds is the best thing you can do. People have been sold on this. Uh, I, I, noticed, I noticed in the um, newspaper just a month ago that most money that investors are now putting in the stock market is going into these index funds. Uh, more and more people realize they can't guess what the fund, you know, they can't guess what stock is going to do best. And the fund managers have been paying can't guess either. Some of them are lucky sometimes, but they're not lucky the next time. So the best you can do is to invest in one of these funds that just tries to track the market. Uh, so, uh, so, that is our hypothesis. Our hypothesis is the market is, is efficient enough because of the trading people are doing, the speculation they're doing, that maybe people, someone with inside information. We can't beat that. that isn't, isn't it sort of self-defeating? Because the, the speculators, when they realize this, they'll just invest in the market. Well, as Mike said, some of them have more information. <laughs> <laughs> 
But they think I think. I mean, hedge funds. <laughs> I mean, I, I mean, my my personal opinion is that, that the sort of the whole concept of hedge fund was a criminal activity. I, <laughs> that's my own personal opinion. Uh, so the hypothesis is that the index is efficient. That's what we mean by the market. The index is efficient. And what does that mean is, that, that means we may, may make money from the stock market, but we're not going to make money any faster than the index does. So if we use the index as our, as our monetary unit, so instead of saying, uh, I have one dollar in the stock market, you could say I have one S&P 500 unit in the stock market. Uh, and uh, if I do just as well as the S&P 500, I just keep my one dollar. Uh, I only make money if I make money uh, faster than the S&P 500 does, or relative to the S&P 500. So, uh, using the, I should have written index here too, this is our efficient index. Using the efficient index hypothesis, Using the efficient index hypothesis, I will show you how to prove that the market index must grow in proportion to its variance. Now, I'm going to assume uh, zero interest rate. That is an assumption that um, actually is not a problem. Uh, because um, traders and specula speculators do not trade with cash. They trade with a uh, money market account, which pays the sort of risk-free rate, government rate of interest for short-term, the, the rate of interest for short-term federal, uh, federal Reserve uh, securities. Uh, so instead of taking, so instead of trading um, uh, in units of dollars, you can trade in terms of units of the money market account, and that effectively makes the interest rate zero. So I assume I don't fool, I don't worry about interest rates. Assumption is the interest rate is zero. Uh, I'm measuring things in that way. Uh, so I'm going to call the index I. Now, uh, I'm going to define what volatility and variance is. So this would be, um, this would be something you learn in your uh, finance class in business school. Uh, so um, let's say the value of the index is, in the first period it's I0, then it's I1, et cetera, up to I capital M. Uh, and the returns, this is a term that they use in finance. What is your return? Uh, your return is like, what percent do you make on your money on each period? The periods could be days, they could be years, they could be hours, they could be seconds or microseconds, depending on how fast you're trading. Uh, some of these high frequency traders trade, you know, in fractions of a second. Uh, so the return is what percentage you make on your money uh, in that period. So you take the, how much, how much money you have in the next period divided the money you started with and divide one, subtract one. So if you started with $5 and you now have $10, you've doubled your money. Uh, this number is 2, and you subtract 1, so it's 2. So a return of 2 is like 200%. So more typically, if this were $1, and this is $1.05, then minus 1, your return is 0.05, that's 5%. Uh, so that's the return on your money. Uh, and you could rewrite it as this. It's the uh, change in, in, in how much money you have. Uh, this is if you're investing in the index. This is the return on the index right now, i.e. the index. This is the change in the index's value divided by the value you started with. It's your percentage uh, change. So uh, the quadratic variation 
is the um, sum of the squared percentage changes. So these percentage changes are small numbers typically. If, you're, if the periods are only daily or, or monthly, they're very small. Even if they're annual, you don't expect more than a 10% uh, a year. So you take 10% uh, 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 a, uh, a year, squared, you know, square 10%, that's uh, 0.1 squared, it's 0.01. So you'd be adding 0.01 over a number of years. You'd have to get 100 years for this to be equal to 1. Uh, if you were doing it on that rate. So the cumulative volatility, th this is the variance, and the volatility is the square root of it. But it's an, it's an amount that increases over time. I'm not, I'm not dividing by capital N. I'm just summing this. I'm increasing, I'm uh, summing up this, this variability over time. So my, my, my conclusion is I'm going to show you that this, so this is going to be increasing over time, and my claim is going to be that the value of the index, the i itself, has to also increase in proportion to that. That's what I'm going to show you. Now, you might feel that um, you might feel that the size of this is going to depend on whether I'm measuring daily or monthly or yearly or or hourly, uh, but actually it turns out that it doesn't matter much. That is the Brownian motion assumption. Uh, that you see, if these, if if I had monthly, I, if I had compressed monthly and yearly, monthly these numbers are much smaller than I'm squaring than if they're yearly. But on the other hand, I'm adding up more of them, uh, and it turns out that squaring them and adding them is just what you need to do uh, in order for the for it not to make much difference whether you're doing it monthly or yearly. So this, uh, so finance people understand this because you know Brownian motion is the stand, or geometric Brownian motion is the standard model. So they understand that the cumulative variance or volatility doesn't depend so much on whether you're measuring it daily or monthly. Uh, it's an accumulated thing. Though they may measure the rate, they may say this is increasing how much per year, or how much per month. So they might they might report the yearly volatility or the uh, daily or monthly volatility. Am I? So I've gotten kind of technical here. Well, OK, this may be a technical question. But if you, so, uh, but you do have to add it up over a large period, lo large number n, whether it's months or years, or if you just took it from the, the, the beginning of time to the end of time and you squared you know, if you took the, the index at the beginning of time, the index at the end of time, and you took that well, to be your return. Of, the, for the U.S. stock market, the beginning of time was 1890, okay. and the end of time was 2005. Okay. So we can measure how much uh, we can measure how much volatility there has been in the U.S. stock market from 1890 to 2005, and we can measure how much the stock market has gone up from 1890 to 2005. Right, I'm saying if you treated that as one period of time yeah. and you squared it, and would that be close to the, oh. you know, would that, you're saying that it doesn't matter how many times you compound. No, no, but, no, but you need to, for you our to theory actually, to work, yeah. you need to have a, yeah, has to be big. Be, yeah, yeah. Does the number of stocks being traded make a difference? Uh, no, not in this, no, not in this theory. S&P 500 has 500 stocks. Uh, but we're not even looking at that breakdown in the stocks, we're just looking at the overall index. Eddie? Run in motion is kind of an idealized model of uh -huh. the evolution, right? Yeah. So what if we have some kind of more realistic, um, more complicated... Well, let me, let me repeat what I said. In this theory, Brownian motion is not an assumption. It's a consequence of... A version of Brownian motion is a consequence of our... Of our Hypothesis. So, is it clear to see why it's a consequence? Pardon? Is it easy to see? Yeah. Uh, no, that's why I'm going to take an hour to explain it. <laughs> okay, now the first step to try to make this explanation. Uh, 
comprehensible is that I am going to measure time by the accumulated variance. This is the accumulated variance. I told you, we decide what unit we're measuring. We're measuring daily, say, or whatever. Uh, and then I'm going to measure time by how much uh, variance there is or volatility. So, uh, you know, think about it this way. Uh, sometimes the stock market gets nervous, it seems like, and the volatility is going up and down very fast. Think of that time is moving faster. Then things calm down, and the volatility is not going up. Time is moving more slowly. So we aren't measuring in calendar time, we're measuring in volatility time. Uh, let's take that to be our unit of time measurement, just to keep things simple. Uh, so, um, I said n is going to be number of days. Uh, so, so on this slide, I, I say we are going to uh, get something out of our hypothesis. I'm now explaining. I'm going to explain something that is a consequence of Brownian motion, but also a consequence of something more elementary. So how do you get Brownian motion? How do you get the, the, uh, the assumption of Brownian motion? The, the classical way of thinking about it is that the, remember, MN is the change, the return for that day. So classically, what people think is that today's return is independent of tomorrow's return. So today, the price has changed because of new information. Tomorrow, you're going to get other new information, which is going to be independent of today's, or at least uncorrelated. Why do people think that's true? You can say, well, you know, maybe, maybe the news is not independent from one day to the next. Maybe um, I'm now... I'm now arguing in favor of the, of, the, of the conventional theory, not my own theory. Uh, the way you think is this. You say, well, you might think that um, good news goes in, uh, in spurts, that if we got good news today, we would have good news tomorrow. But if you do think that way, if you do believe that, if your experience is like that, you will, when you get good news today, you already take the good news for tomorrow for granted. And you'll raise the price, you'll bid up the price, not only from today's news, but from the news you expect tomorrow. So tomorrow, whatever it is, it's going to be a surprise because <laughs> it's going to be uncorrelated with today. It's going to be a surprise because to the extent that it's not a surprise, you already figured that out. You see, you're so smart. Uh, so, the idea, so that's the idea that the changes from day to day are independent. Okay, so probability theory says that if you have things that are random and independent, their variances add. Their variances add. Uh, so that means, and if they, if each of them has the same variance, if every day you get, you know, roughly the amount of, of change that you get every day, always has standard deviation sigma. So then uh, you add up the changes um, squared from day to day. That's going to be an estimate of n times sigma squared. Uh, so that is, um, that says that the, um, rel the, qu the total uh, quadratic variation is going to be proportional to the time elapsed. N is the time elapsed. The total quadratic variation should be proportional to that. Uh, so, um, uh, <clears throat> so we aren't making any probability assumptions. We're just making our, um, Index, our efficient index hypothesis. Uh, but still, we expect the same kind of thing, that roughly the, um, the uh, total variance is going to be a proportion of the time. Uh, so that kind of justifies that we're going to take that total variance as the measure of our time, our clock time. I think, um, I'm not sure that slide was necessary. OK. Now I'm going to do some uh, pretend like I'm doing some fancy mathematics. 
I'm not really going to do fancy mathematics, but I'm going to pretend that I am. See, one, one beauty of this, the math department is teaching these guys, for, training guys from Wall Street by teaching them continuous time stochastic uh, mathematics. Uh, it's very, mathematically very challenging. Uh, but it makes it look like you know something. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to go to continuous time. They use major theoretic continuous time, but we're going to use game theoretic continuous time. And uh, make it, we've managed to get this, we actually, 15 years ago, we tried to publish these ideas uh, in discrete time, which is realistic. They said, this is just arithmetic. We could not get it published. So now we're, we, we've dressed it up with the, this phony continuous time that we can publish it. <laughs> so um, we're going to measure time by the cumulative variance. So now we think about these returns as infinitesimals. Uh, and, but we're going to write, I'm going to write I sub s for the value of the index at time s. Now, for the time being, when I use this little s, I am measuring time by the cumulative variance. I just write sigma, that's the cumulative variance. Observe, you know, the cumulative actual variance. Not a, usually the word variance is used for something theoretical. But here I'm using variance as is used in finance sometimes for the actual accumulated squared changes. Uh, that's my sigma, and I'm measuring time by that sigma. So I sub s is now the index, the value of the index at time s, where s is measured in elapsed variation, not in clock time. And I'm going to assume that uh, at time zero, when I start, the index's value is one. That's like taking the speed of light as one. Uh, I'm taking the value of the S&P 500 as one. We can have the same debate as the S&P. Now, see, the S&P 500, unlike the speed of light, the S&P 500 has a precise value, <laughs> an exact value. <laughs> uh, so the, so here is what um, we're going to prove after a fashion. We're going to prove that the efficient index hypothesis implies that the value of the stock at time s will look like the exponent of s divided by 2 plus w sub s, where w sub s is bound in motion. So this is a stochastic model. w s is Brownian in motion. I take the exponent of a constant plus that. But this is this this s is the um, uh, is the accumulated variance. It's my uh, accumulated variance time. Now this, when you take Brownian motion and add a constant to it, and take the exponent of it, that's called a geometric Brownian motion. But in general, geometric Brownian motion, uh, you can add any constant you want to here. So, but we're saying no, you can't add any constant you want. There's a particular constant that goes here. On the other hand, you're not dealing with clock time. You're dealing with accumulated variance time. So, uh, Brownian motion says you have this steady uh, amount of variation. Uh, we aren't assuming a steady amount of variation. Sometimes the variation can be big, sometimes the variation can be small. Uh, so uh, we're assuming it looks like Brownian motion only when you rescale time. Uh, you, you measure time by the speed of the ups and downs. Uh, when you do that, it looks like geometric Brownian motion. Uh, that's, what, that's what we're concluding. Uh, now, geometric Brownian motion uh, <clears throat> this particular geometric, in general, geometric Brownian motion 
has a drift and a volatility. Uh, this particular geometric Brownian motion has drift one and volatility one. Uh, and if you look at, I'm now just reporting to you what you could get from the textbook. Open up your textbook, your finance, financial stochastics textbook, and look up what is the expected value of the logarithm of geometric Brownian motion with drift one and volatility one, and what's its standard deviation? And you find out the logarithm of it has expected value s over two. Uh, and the standard deviation of the logarithm uh, is um, uh, the square root of s. Now, think about what that's saying. S is the accumulated variation. We're going to measure this over a long period of time. We're going to measure, we're going to look at the stock market from 1890 to 1905, uh, to 2005. We're going to look at the stock market for 115 years or something, or 120, I forget. Uh, so S is going to be a big number. Uh, so S over 2 is going to be a big number. The square root of S is going to be a much smaller number. Uh, right, if S is 200, this is 100, and the square root of S is um, uh, 10 or something. So approximately, this logarithm is going to be approximately equal to its mean because the square root is going to be much smaller. Uh, so, you know, the, the the logarithm should be equal to its expected value plus or minus two standard deviations. So we're looking at basically the logarithm of the um, uh, index should be equal to s over 2. So this is what I mean when I say that the, uh, this is the consequence I announced that the logarithm is going to grow and its growth rate is going to be proportional to its uh, to its accumulated variance. I got S over two here. Uh, that's so. This will be a, this will be followed as a consequence of this. This is what I want to prove. So this is my this is what I'm going to show. I'm going to show that when time is measured by cumulative variance. Uh, the logarithm of the uh, index is going to be equal, approximate the um, uh, elapsed, the accumulated variance divided by 2. Uh, so if I go back to clock time, remember S is equal to uh, the accumulated variance, so I'm going to substitute that symbol for accumulated variance, and this, this equation is the same one as this, except I, I was using this little s to make it look like time. Now I'm substituting in the, in the sigma to remind you that it's really cumulative variance. Now, in terms of calendar time, when you have, let's call capital T to be the amount, let's say little t is the time when you have that amount of cumulative variance. So I can put, I can put t here, but here I've got the accumulative variance at time t. So this is another way of writing the same information. That at actually calendar time t, uh, the logarithm of my, uh, of my money at time t relative to the index. Uh, excuse me, not my money, but the logarithm of the value of the index at time t is approximately equal to its accumulated variance at time t divided by 2. Uh, that's what I want to so I'm just still just writing in different ways what it is I want to show you. Now, I have to do a little bit of elementary finance here. I've got to start by explaining to you that the average return overestimates growth in finance. Let's say, let's say that you um, Let me, uh, let's say that you invest your money with me and uh, that on average I produce zero return for you. 
Some years I make money for you, some years I lose money. But the average return is zero. What's going to happen to your money if you invest it with me? If the average return is zero, what's going to happen to it? Uh, IRS takes the gains. Worse than that. Let's say there's no taxes. What's going to happen if, if one year your money goes up 10%? It's going to go away. Very right. If your money goes up 10% one year and goes down 10% the next year, what's happened? You start with $100. The next year you have $110. Now what's, what's, what's 10% of 110? It's 11. You subtract 11 from 110, you have $99. So if the money goes up and down, up 10%, down 10%, you've lost a dollar. Right? So average return overestimates the growth. And the bigger the variance is, the worse that is. Let's say your money goes up, let's say your money goes up by 50% the first year. You give me your money, you give me $100, next year you got $150. Now it goes down 50%. What's 50% of 150? 75. Now you got $75, right? <laughs> so the bigger the variance, the more money you're losing uh, if the average return is zero. So if, my, if I can give you average return 10% and the variance is big enough, I can easily, make, I can easily get all your money very quickly. <laughs> I can, you know. So financial firms actually do this. They advertise their average return. Uh, and that very advertising, advertising their average return is, is, is a kind of a fraud uh, because uh, you can have a high average return and be losing money. Uh, the average return overestimates the growth in variance by half the variance. Excuse me, the growth in value by half the variance. So you can do that with some simple math. The Taylor series of a logarithm. Uh, you can understand that. And I don't know for this audience whether I want to talk about Taylor series of logarithms. The Taylor expansion of the logarithm of 1 plus x is x minus 1 half squared. Uh, so this is like half the variance. Uh, so because of that, the logarithm is, you know, when you're multiplying by 10%, decreasing 10%, uh, you're dealing with, you know, you're increasing the logarithm up and down. Uh, so uh, uh, the bottom line is uh, that if you go through this sort of simple math, which it's amazing, I, when I teach finance, uh, you know, I teach the students this and they say, oh, I didn't remember that. It, it's, something, it's so simple, uh, but even our students often miss it. So this says that the index, the logarithm of the index, uh, is going to be equal to the total growth the sum of the returns. See here I've got, uh, this is the return, and I'm adding it over all the years, or all the days. So uh, I use capital M, I didn't introduce that. Oh, here it is, capital M is the sum of the returns. Uh, sigma is the sum of the returns squared. That's the, this is the accumulated variance. This is the, it's not the total growth. The total growth is the logarithm of i. Uh, M is the total returns, the sum of the returns. So the logarithm of the value you have at the end is equal to the sum of the returns minus half the variance. You've got to subtract half the variance from your total returns to see how much you've actually increased your money. Uh, that's, this, is not, this has nothing to do with our theory. This is just a little bit of elementary finance. Uh, but uh, our theory, which I still have not explained, uh, says that the logarithm of, the, uh, of your money will be equal to half the accumulated variance. Uh, the properties we just explained said that if you want to get the total, so some of the returns, uh, that's going to be equal to this 
plus another half of the variance. So if I want to look at my, if, so that means that, um, uh, that what I'm going to show you is, you know, you take, you take this in the air and you have the sum, half the variance plus half the variance, you get the total variance. So what I'm going to show you is the sum of the returns is equal to this accumulated variance. So I said it was proportional to the accumulated variance. Uh, here I'm saying it's approximately equal to the accumulated variance. Now the sum of the returns, I say again, the sum of the returns is a deceptive number. You look at the, you look at the stock market returns over 100 years, that's not by how much you've increased your money. Uh, because uh, it's overestimating how much you've increased your money by this amount. But it's still what people measure. They measure, uh, if you look at the reports on the proportion, uh, reports, if you look at the reports on the performance of the stock market, they tell you what the average return was. So the average return would be the, you know, the total return divided by the number of years. So they actually report the average or total return. Uh, and so our theory says that average or total return uh, is going to be equal to the accumulated variance. So I just keep telling you what it is I'm going to prove. Uh, right. So the, um, I'm just trying, I'm just making an observation but trying to connect. So if you look at the, it's, if you look at it backwards, I mean, and instead of, if you look at it right to left. So the variance, this must have something to do with what you were describing with the Brownian motion. Right, the the variance of uh, what distribution at time t is normal zero t, so it has variance t. And you've been measuring time in terms of the uh, in terms of this accumulated return, right? Or in yeah, terms yeah, of yeah, super. Yeah, yeah. I think that's right. We're we're talking about uh, this is uh, yeah. So that's right. Uh, we're saying that the uh, the value of the index is going to be geometric Brownian motion. But if you take the log, uh, you give it the exponent of that Brownian motion. But still, even after you take the log, you've got, um, after you take the log, you've still got the log. You don't have m here. You have the log. Uh, so the difference between m and the log is still giving you that other s over 2. So the point is that, you know, the Brownian motion part is supposed to be dominated by this part. Uh, so you take the logs. So I'm going, we're going in circles now. Okay, so um, here, here is the, uh, here are what the actual numbers are. Uh, so the annualized volatility of the S&P 500 um, is approximately 20%. Uh, that means this number here, uh, this, um, uh, this accumulated variance is the square of 20%, that's 4%. 0.2 squared is 0 0.04. So that is the, um, uh, <clears throat> so uh, our prediction is that on an annualized basis, the returns should be about 4%, uh, whereas the, um, the risk aversion theory only explains about 1% uh, instead of the uh, 4%. And this, you know, the, the, the actual observed uh, growth is a little bit closer to 6% than 4%, but it's within, you know, from our approximations, we've got, you could look at what the expected error would be of our approximations, and it's within that bound. Uh, so, now, so now, so I, I've all I've been working through to explain what it is that I want to prove to you. 
I'm supposedly going to prove to you that the um, total growth, the total returns, the sum of the returns is equal to, approximately equal to the sum of the, uh, the accumulated volatility. I'm going to claim this is implied by the, uh, the um, efficient index hypothesis. How do I get that implication? Well, the efficient index hypothesis is that you can't beat the market. There's no simple strategy that beats the market. So I'm going to sh what I need to do is show you simple strategies that will beat the market if that's not true. If the market doesn't grow at the same rate as its variance is accumulating, I should be able to beat it. Now, obviously, I need two different strategies. I have one way of beating the market if it is not growing fast enough, and another way of beating the market if it is growing too fast. Well, that sounds like it's kind of obvious almost what you would do. If it's not growing fast enough, you short it. If it's growing too fast, you borrow money and buy it. And that works. That's all. So not only are there strategies, but the strategies are very simple. And something we know about such simple strategies is there are people doing them all the time. Betting the market will go up by borrowing money and, and buying the market. Betting it will go down by shorting the market. There are 10,000 traders in Manhattan doing that right now. And you can count on them doing that every day. So uh, you have an explanation of, of you know, uh, why this is happening. You have an explanation of why you, the market looks like a kind of Brownian motion. So the trading strategy. Uh, <clears throat> So, you know, this gets, um, the previous slide where I had Taylor series, I skipped over it. Uh, this is the same thing as going on. If the, if, the, if the accumulated volatility is too much greater than the market uh, growth, uh, then I am going to short the market uh, and um, no, wait a minute. If it's going too fast, if it's going too fast, I'm going to put money in the market. That means that I'm going to take my current capital and I'm going to invest one plus more. I'm going to invest more money than I have in the market if it's growing too fast. Uh, and uh, so I've got to do, and when I do that, uh, the market is going to grow at the rate 1 plus m, but I'm going to grow at the rate 1 plus, 1 plus epsilon m because I have more invested in the market than the market does. Uh, so I'm going to take the logarithm of this to see how, how fast I'm growing. I'm going, to, you know, I'm going to take the logarithm of that, and I again have a Taylor series of the logarithm, and I get the Taylor series of the logarithm has, a, um, uh, you know, has this squared term where I'm squaring this and I get a... Uh, you multiply that out. So I don't, you know, it's a very simple arithmetic. Uh, but um, you know, I work through the arithmetic, and I, I mean, I would have to think harder. And uh, it's been a while since I did look at these slides. I would have to think about them, and you would have to think about them. But let me, so let me go to the example. Let's say that I invest 1% more money than I have in the market. Uh, in that case, I will multiply my capital uh, relative to the index uh, by e to the You're assuming one and a half times. I'm assuming these things, yeah. yeah. 
if I'm assuming that if uh, the market uh, is uh, half a, half again as big, and if the accumulated if the accumulated return is 50% more than the accumulated variance, uh, but also uh, the accumulated variance is so big that the 1% um, uh, of it is 3. So that means the accumulated variance has to be 300. So that means I have to do this not just for 10 years, but for 20, 30, 40 years uh, to get that big accumulated variance. Uh, so I just choose these numbers as examples. In that case, uh, I will multiply my capital relative to the market by four and a half times. So that's something I needed to do over many, many decades. And then, you know, I turn it around. If the money go, if my money goes, if my uh, index grows too slowly, uh, then I don't invest all my money in the market. I put some of it in the risk-free bond, uh, which is like cash since I'm assuming zero interest rate. Uh, and of course, uh, I'm going to do both strategies simultaneously. I'm going to take half my money uh, and, you know, uh, bet against the market and take the other half my money and, best, and bet for the market. And I'll do that over a hundred years. Uh, and, you know, it doesn't matter if I lose all of one pot because I'll multiply the other pot by a very large factor. Uh, so half my money multiplied by 100 is like all my money multiplied by 50. I don't care that I lost the other half. Uh, so that's the, um, uh, that's the, the idea, the basic idea of the math. So I've shown you some basic mathematics here. Actually, to do it rigorously, you know, my colleague Volodya, you've met him, or he came and gave a seminar here last year. Uh, he's written a bunch of papers. Some of them have my name on them, because uh, I started doing this work with him. But I, I should say one thing. I'm making it here look like we're doing Riemann integrals. But actually, to make it work, you've got to do LeBeg integrals. Uh, so that's fancifying it. But in some sense, you know, the real world in the stock market is not continuous. It's discrete. So the math I'm showing you is the real story. Uh, the fancy papers that we had to, that the Lloyd has been writing to, you know, get in the math journals is uh, is kind of the phony version, if you will. Uh, you know, this in some sense is the real version of the story. Um, okay. I just wanted to ask. So um, I thought you said earlier about George Soros that you don't allow lines of credit, or was that? What is this? Is this epsilon? Not you're, you're you're borrowing money. Is that is that different? Yeah, you, that's uh, no, it's not. You got to put a limit on it. In other words, that's a very good point. We promised a strategy that multiplies the capital at risks, so you need to implicate it in a way that risks no more than its initial capital. So um, you have to stop the strategy if the capital is too close to zero. Mm -hmm. right. So you are, uh, when we do this in the, in the discrete time, you do have to make an assumption that in one trading period, you're not going to lose it all. Uh, and in continuous time, one of the neat things about this, this continuous time picture is you don't have to make that as an assumption because since Brownian motion is continuous, mm. you can stop before you lose all your money. So uh, in, in, in practice, it really is possible in the stock market to lose all your money in one day or one trading period. Uh, so. Um, this has a loophole if the market completely crashes and nobody can uh, keep up their trading strategy, uh, then it's not going to work. Did that answer the question? It's a good, uh, I'm glad you asked the question. Yeah, I'm, 
Yeah. Think it, think it, yeah, <laughs> try. So, uh, the last thing to say about it is, um, what are the macroeconomic implications of this? So uh, basically, this theory says the stock market has to go up. Now, the stock market is about half of the economy. What's not in the stock market? The S&P 500 in, in the United States represents about half of the wealth. Where's the other half? Bonds, houses, other assets. Bonds, houses, uh, private corporations. So if you read the business pages, there's always a story about somebody going public or going private. Uh, so, um, so this is about, this says the part that is in publicly traded corporations uh, where you're able to buy and sell. And why do, why do I keep talking about the S&P 500 instead of talking about some broader market index? It's because this kind of strategy can only work if you're able to trade. Uh, there's, you know, there's a lot of other, there's a lot of stocks listed on the New York Stock Exchange that do not trade very often. They're called small cap stocks, where cap means capitalization. So a stock that does not have that much money in it, uh, you may go, it may be publicly traded in theory, but it may go many days without any, any, any changing hands. Uh, and a strategy like this, which says that every day you're going to buy this much of it uh, or sell this much of it, that's not going to work if there's nobody there to buy or sell from. Uh, so there's got to be a willing, this only works for stocks that are uh, active and big enough that somebody is willing to buy and sell them every day. You go, and, you go to the market and you see what the price is and you say, I want to buy. Uh, you see what the price is and say, I want to sell. Uh, that's only the big stocks. That's only the stocks basically that are in the S&P 500. So this is about the S&P 500, which as I say represents about half of the economy. The other half is the small cap stocks, even if they're publicly traded. The privately held corporations, uh, which uh, nobody's offering to, to sell or buy, you know, to you or me, uh, and people's houses and uh, uh, other wealth. So what this says is, that the, uh, the part of the economy that is in stocks has to increase in proportion to its volatility. What that suggests is it could get out of balance with the rest of the economy. Uh, that it could be that just because of the volatility, the stock market is growing, the value of the stock market is growing more slowly, maybe, in the 1950s, the stock market grew slowly. It's possible it was growing too slowly because it wasn't volatile enough. Everybody was calmed down. Eisenhower was president. Nobody was going anywhere. Uh, right? Uh, things weren't too exciting. It meant the stock market was growing slowly. Uh, maybe it meant that the stock market was actually worth less than people's houses, you know, it, maybe the stock market should have been higher relative to the price of other things because that's what we're doing. We're comparing it to the price of other things. The uh, prices of, uh, of privately held companies, small businesses, uh, real estate. Uh, maybe the stock market, if it's more productive, I mean, in theory, by according to the economics theory, the, the price of the stock market should be, should be governed by how productive it is, how much that investment can produce in wealth. So, you know, you've got the corporations, the big corporations, how much can they produce in wealth? You've got my small business and, uh, uh, you know, and uh, how much can it produce in wealth? So is the, is the private economy privatized as opposed to the publicly traded economy, which is being more productive? That should determine their relative prices. 
But instead, you've got this publicly traded where the price is being controlled by the volatility. Uh, so that could be out of whack. So the stock market, according to this theory, the stock market could be, it's, it could be undervalued and kept undervalued uh, as long as it doesn't get more volatile. Or it could be overvalued because there's so much politics going on or something. Uh, which means that it would be, you, you'd be paying more for it, which is what it looks like today. I mean, in the 50s it might be undervalued, but today all this uh, craziness keeps its price going up, 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 relative to uh, other productive uh, sectors of the economy. Uh, what's going to happen? Can, what, how can, uh, what's going to happen in that conditions? So the economists, uh, I mean, if you're a Marxist, then you say, aha, finally the system is going to collapse. <laughs> <laughs> but if you're an economist, uh, you're going to make the share, you're going to look at ways, if you're a non-Marxist economist, which they all are, you're going to say, aha, we will, make the, um, we will make the fraction of the economy that's in the stock market endogenous, which means that this imbalance will drive people to change the fraction of the stock, of the, uh, to change how much of the economy is in the stock market. If the stock market is, is uh, growing too fast, then put some of this, that means there's productive, there's some productive assets outside the, the stock market uh, that are undervalued. Put them in the stock market. Monetize the real estate. Monetize the student loans. <laughs> Make them into things that can be traded in the stock market. Uh, whereas if it's the other way, if you're in the 1950s and the stock market is undervalued, uh, then uh, you want to take uh, uh, those undervalued things and, and take them out. So anyway, I probably garbled what I just said, but I think I got across, hopefully got across the idea. That, this, that the fraction that's in the stock market is not stable. You can privatize companies that are in the stock market. You can take companies that are uh, in the stock market, that are not in the stock market, you can take them public, uh, etc. So uh, to the extent that these pressures are actually uh, come to bear, uh, you could get economic reactions uh, from the speculation. So this is... Um, this is something that, uh, you know, Volodya and I have been trying to sell to the finance people for 15 years. Uh, but uh, for a more philosophical audience, uh, my point of it is that there are things that look like objective probabilities. The stock market looks like Brownian motion uh, that are really just uh, emergent phenomena that is a product of, of of the game. Of the, game. So. the game is people um, buying and selling stocks. Well, why isn't that probabilistic itself? And so why aren't these why aren't these subjective probabilities ultimately depend on those together with other things things going on in the surface? Well, I mean, I, you could call anything probabilistic if you wanted, but what in fact is going on is that there are thousands of people using... You see, the, the strategies that I talked about are very simple strategies. The two strategies that are being implemented here are that you overinvest in the market systematically or you underinvest in the market systematically. And you don't have to do that with immense amounts of capital. Uh, so there are thousands of speculators on Wall Street that run strategies like that all the time. Uh, were they, are there some kinds of objective probabilities that cause them to do that? Uh, or do they have free will, these guys? <laughs> uh, it's clearly uh, people playing, people deliberately speculating that's produced, that produces it. Yeah. So giving it a, a more fundamental probabilistic explanation seems like kind of a, 
complicated uh, uh, addition uh, to what's on the If you think on. that um, everything is made up out of part, you know, atoms or molecules, and you think that there's a uh, statistical uh, account of how, uh, what state they're in, you'll think that, uh, uh, that these apparent emergent probabilities are also emerge from um, statistical mechanical probabilities. Does that help explain it, though? <laughs> Doesn't it make it, it harder it, to understand? It puts it in a big picture. <laughs> <laughs> so you understand where all probabilities come from. Uh, I think, uh, but another aspect of the picture is that, I mean, hearkening back to, to Abraham Wald and Edwin Mises, we are talking about a mass, what were their words? Uh, repetitive events and, and mass phenomena. Um, so you, you, it takes some time before this will emerge. You need to, uh, it doesn't emerge with a few trains. It takes an intensity. Eddie? So suppose the world is very simple classical mechanical model uh, on phase space. You can also talk about the running motion emerging from the mechanical laws. F equals ma, my new particle position for momentum. Right. Um, that seems to be analogous to the case here, where you have. Why, why does Brownian motion emerge from F equals ma? Well, basically, you look at the, um, the phase space trajectory. So, uh, oh, you know, and Einstein's Brownian motion. Eddie is helping me out. <laughs> <laughs> so basically, you just think about the particle take random walks in the phase space. Um, well, random walks do produce, yeah, random walks, Brownian uh, motion is the limit of random walks, yeah. Right, emerging from the dynamics. Okay, I'm not. Yeah, because they, the particles are going yeah. to collide with each other or they, they are under electromagnetic forces. And in classical mechanics, they're just following the terms this of is laws, a, but This is a. Certainly this is not the same theory because we have, what you have is time rescaled. You have a specific geometric Brownian motion with rescaled time. So it's a different emergence than you would have in uh, that Einstein found. Oh, no, 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 I don't mean the Einstein original version of motion. I think it satisfies both the geometric quantum motion and the usual Werner process. What does? The uh, base basic dynamics. It's not scale invariant completely. Um, so it takes some time averages over some periods. I don't know. I, don't, I mean, you're saying different models could produce different versions of Brownian motion. Yeah, that's, that's true. That's, is that what you're saying? I mean, obviously, a single Brownian motion cannot be both geometric Brownian motion and regular Brownian motion. Uh, they're not the same thing. Are they mutually exclusive? Yes. One of them takes negative values and the other one doesn't. Uh, this is a, this, these stock prices cannot take negative values. So it's a, it's a version of geometric Brownian motion but it's, a, it's geometric rounding motion with a particular drift and volatility, but then with time rescaled arbitrarily. I see. I think they're pretty much similar, right? Then it broke rounding motion and then this type of rounding motion. Depends on how. Wasn't this the a time that something That something can take negative values, you may regard that as important or not. Isn't this a function of, I mean, you can, you've expressed it as a function of Brownian motion or not, right? Yeah, geometric yeah, Brownian motion is, a, is an exponentiation of Brownian motion. Yeah. That's right. That's right. But the time rescaling is something, well, I'm sure you could find examples in physics of time rescaling, too. I mean, there's a lot of emergent property. There's a lot of things in physics that you can be treated as emergent properties. Uh, emergent stochastic properties, but, and it has a similar feature that the emergence, I mean, one feature that is similar is that you don't get the emergence unless you have enough 
particles interacting. Right. And in physics, obviously, you could also have situations where you have fewer particles interacting and you wouldn't get that emergence. Right. Uh, and it becomes large, it becomes yeah. large, and now you have that phenomenon. I was wondering, when you talk about time invariance, sorry, time scaling invariance that's broken. I didn't say invariance, I said time rescaling, yes. Right, so that's broken in this model, right? So time scaling invariance is broken. I think the word invariant is misplaced. Time is arbitrarily scaled. There's no question about, we aren't talking about anything that would be invariant to time. It's just that time is rescaled by the volatility. Right, so that's why I'm confused. Because Brownian motion usually gives you a scale invariant model. Scale, what scale, what scale are you, you're not talking so about? Rescale time, you get the same kind of uh, Brownian motion. But it is not, it's not okay. You rescale time. What do you mean by rescaling time? I think if you just take Brownian motion over the unit interval and you multiply by t, then that's the, that's the same as Brownian motion over the year, you zero t, between zero and t. Well, that, that has. That's what, is that what you mean? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I don't think that's. That's not the issue here. Is the issue is that time is moving faster sometimes than other times. There's a variation in the speed in which time is moving. Uh, I mean, it's still true that if you you have the same kind of picture, if you change the scale at which you measure it, but still you'd have that variability. And this is, in fact, what you do observe. You do observe uh, uh, this stochastic. This. I mean, the, the finance, uh, mathematical finance people have come up with lots of very complicated models to try to, um, uh, you know, non-standard models that are that are make this and that stochastic. Uh, this is, in, in comparison to what they do, this is a very this is a simpler picture. Sean, no. At the beginning, you talked about the mismatch between the six percent observed and the one percent predicted by the version model. Yeah. So is that your model accounted for? This model, this model predicts about four percent. Four percent. So I was just wondering whether or not your model. Get the six percent. Well, the six percent is. It, we can say this. Our model predicts two to six percent. <laughs> because there was an approximation used there. I see. Uh, I'm, I was also wondering whether or not your model takes into account the macroeconomic responses. To. Uh, no, I don't think that's something that needs to be taken into account. I think the question is, what, whether that's happening is irrelevant to the correctness of our model. Uh, it's just that's a something that might result from from what we're observing or what we're suggesting. They're very, you know, in economics, of course, I guess I'm not too serious about this as a contribution to economics, but that's because I'm not too serious about economics as a contribution to knowledge. <laughs> I think these effects, I mean, this would be such a general effect, and there's so many other things going on. Uh, uh, Demetrius? Yeah, so, so is it fair to say that if, if you're, what you say is correct, then the best strategy for an investor is to find the most highly volatile, but still efficient, index. So if, if volatility tracks average return, right, so. Well, this suggests there's more than one index. Well, right, that's, that's where I'm, I'm, I'm going with this, right? Uh, so, there are, aren't they? But, right, so are you committed essentially to saying there's one efficient index? There should be. There should be. Uh, the problem is this whole theory is obviously 
connecting this mathematical theory to the to, the, to the phenomena. <laughs> but, so this is so you mentioned hedge funds. It seems to me that this sort of is what happened with hedge funds, right? I mean, hedge funds are not. Uh, you can't trade in hedge funds. What can you actually trade in? I mean, if you think about. Okay, think about these guys on Wall Street that. But I'm thinking the hedge fund as the tra as the trader, trader as the trading entity. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, the traders, the hedge, some of these people work for hedge funds, or they just work for some rich guy, or they work with their own money. Okay, so you think about all these guys sitting uh, in their living rooms or in somebody's office and uh, somebody's trading floor doing this stuff. What, what can they trade in readily? Well, there's also, aside from the S&P 500, there's some foreign exchange traded funds. You could, you could start trading in currencies. That's a little bit unstable. Uh, so the S&P 500 is not quite the whole universe of what people can trade off on. So, so there would be, so to try to make this theory more accurate, you would want to say these guys are not really dealing with the S&P 500. The S&P 500 is all we can get data for. But you, right. could, you could imagine that there's a better, that they're in the real world. Uh, there's a better, um, something a little better than the S&P 500, which represents what people really can trade. Uh, and that would be the, the total value of that would be the index. Uh, but I don't see a world where I'm not imagining, I mean, maybe what you're suggesting, I mean, your question would suggest, okay, we've got the guys in New York that are doing this. Maybe if they could go off to Athens, and maybe there's a world there that is not, that you can't get to from New York, and you can't trade it back and forth, but just in Athens, you look at what's available to you there, maybe that's a completely different world. And if it's more volatile, maybe you can invest there. Go to another, on the other hand, how do you get out? <laughs> I would recommend go to another, that. <laughs> go, to, go to another planet. But, but, but it, it seems like, it, I mean, that's, that's, that seems to be a very interesting consequence of, yeah. of, of the theory. It's correct. It's something that's even testable somehow. Have you ever tried it? Well, about that? In the sense of that, I don't. S well, no, because I, I don't really, I, I, well, no, this is all the tests we've done. But I, I don't really see these independent uh, places where you've got separate indexes that you can't trade off against each other because they're in different locations, a different planet, et cetera. I, and, and if you... But I'm thinking, maybe I'm thinking, okay, tell me, let me... I mean, the, in some sense, this has been, this kind of equity premium has been tested in several different markets. The U.S. is the only one where we have, where we can, the U.S. is the only place where we can plausibly trace a history of more than 100 years. So it's harder to test it uh, uh, in other isolated markets. I mean, there was, you know, the, the British and, uh, you, you don't have a continuous uh, record. I mean, we've had some crashes in the U.S., but there's basically a continuous record. Whereas in Germany and France, uh, we don't have that. 